Great. I think we still have a few folks trickling in, but we're going to get started. Um, welcome to Pandemic, uh, From Pandemic to Progress, Innovations, Interventions, and Lessons from Districts. My name is Mary Wells, and I'm Managing Partner and Co-Founder of Bellwether Education Partners. Bellwether is a national nonprofit organization with a mission to improve education outcomes for underserved students, which we do by helping other education organizations like schools, nonprofits, and districts improve their work and impact for underserved students. This is the second in our three-part series in which we aim to hear directly from district and other leaders who are deep in the work right now, directly serving students in this challenging time. What have we learned? Which innovations, interventions, and lessons from this past year should we continue in the next school year? What can schools and districts do as we move from pandemic to progress? And how can districts effectively and equitably serve the most marginalized students despite the many challenges? Today's conversation will focus on outreach and operations. The leaders on our panel have been working in new ways over the past year to collaborate with parents, educators, community organizations, and more in order to engage students, families, and to overcome operational challenges. We'll talk with them today about what they've learned about operations and outreach this year, their plans for next year, and what they think should be on all of our minds as we look forward to next year. Our panelists today are Michael Metsuda, Superintendent of Anaheim Union High, sorry, Anaheim Union High School District in California, Amanda Fernandez, CEO and co-founder of Latinos for Education based in Boston, and Peter Hiltz, Chief Education Officer of Falcon District 49 in Colorado. Michael Matsuda has served as superintendent of Anaheim UHSD since 2014, a district of more than 30,000 students in grades seven through 12. His focus has been on innovation, entrepreneurship, and building career pathways in collaboration with higher education and employers. Before taking on the role of superintendent, Mr. Matsuda spent 22 years as an educator in the district. Amanda Fernandez is the CEO and co-founder of Latinos for Education, the first Latino founded and led national organization solely dedicated to creating leadership pathways for emerging Latino leaders uh, in education and focused on diversifying education nonprofit boards. This year, Amanda has played another role in her Boston community, one, um, as a leader of the Community Learning Collaborative, which is a joint effort of Latinos for Education, YMCA of Greater Boston, The Base, and Inquilinos Boricuras Anexion to provide more than a dozen free learning pods to mostly Black and Latino low-income students in the Boston area. And finally, Peter Hiltz has served as Chief Education Officer of Falcon District 49 also known as D49, um, since 2013. And before that, he was a leader of the Classical Academy in Colorado Springs. At D49, Peter oversees the education of over 20,000 students in 25 schools in a rural and suburban district in collaboration with his district co-leaders who are a, a, a COO and a CBO in lieu of a, a sort of traditional superintendent role. D49 is arranged in four zones, offering different educational options to families. And Peter's focus has been on innovation initiatives, organizational reform, and strategic planning for schools and districts. So welcome to the panelists. I'm excited to engage with you all. I want to start with Michael and Peter. We all know that millions of students are missing this year or only marginally engaged in school. What has the past year changed about your relationships with families? And what have you learned in this past year about staying connected to families and students? Michael, do you wanna thank you. jump in first? Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, first of all, I wanna thank Bellwether and Mary and um, the entire uh, commun Bellwether community for this opportunity. I really, uh, I think all of us appreciate your mission and vision um, focusing on the marginalized students across America. 
So I think there's a lot of lessons learned, but especially in connecting with families and communities. One is the importance of the, you know, just the, the branding of public schools and building trust and having those connections are really, really vital. And that plays out in the classroom with engaging lessons focused on social emotional. I think the other layer to this is the, we call them the family and uh, community engagement specialists. We have one at every site. I think many schools have different iterations of that uh, to uh, have those relationships with uh, the parents and families. I think the third thing too, and maybe Amanda can speak to this later, but the importance of the community nonprofits as partners in this larger collaborative, especially as we uh, head into the testing, the COVID testing and uh, the vaccinations, uh, you have a lot of, uh, uh, especially communities of color who are on the fence about these issues, right? And um, we need to, uh, our faith-based co communities, our nonprofits, our schools where there's a lot of trust, right? With these communities of color. So all of these things are, are hopefully, uh, uh, you know, relationships that we've been forced to continue to build in a good way, but we will continue to have those relationships as we go forward because certainly the, the world is forever changed and for us to go backwards would be a huge uh, mistake. And I think that's gonna make us much stronger as institutions uh, the, you know, these collaborations and these partnerships. Mary, I want to echo Michael's thanks uh, for, for hosting the event. I think we have an opportunity to capture learning from a, a dramatic and um, maybe not intentional, but necessary learning, learning event. And one of the, the big learnings for us was to, to unmask the illusion of independence. And what I mean by that is that uh, we, we thought we operated pretty independently as a district. Uh, I'm in a region where we have 12 different school districts. Colorado is pretty fiercely committed to local control. And so uh, El Paso, Teller, Douglas County, um, in, in our area, all of our counties host multiple school districts. And we found that we really needed to count on each other because in my district, uh, I have the students of a teacher in another district, and they have the children of one of my uh, uh, support professionals. And so decisions that we made impacted other districts, sometimes pretty dramatically. So we decided that in, in a crisis, we needed to increase the tempo of our collaboration. We normally met as superintendents monthly. We started meeting weekly. We started meeting with our county health department every other week so that we could stay in tighter collaboration. So the tempo of communication is something that, that we had to turn up. We also had to turn down the, the sense of disconnection or, or independence. And for us, that meant that we decided to adopt a regional strategy for all of our free meal distribution. So we didn't care where a student attended school. We, we simply said, if you come to our facility and you need, you need breakfast and lunch, we're gonna give you breakfast and lunch. We'll keep track of it. But we really took down some of those artificial barriers that were based on arbitrary geographic uh, designations, literally from 120 years ago, uh, and we said we're going to we're going to serve the students of our community. Um, that it's not as easy to do that on the educational front, but we tried to do it there as well. And so, although we do we do have a lot of students in our region, about 5,000 students that did not engage in any significant way or at all. Um, here's one of the humbling things that we have learned. Some of those students didn't need our schools as much as we thought because they came out of the shadows back into our schools when we started offering in-person learning and more of them were on track than we would have predicted. Uh, we have been surprised at how many students were able to either sustain learning um, or, or at least not fall as far behind as we thought as we did our own classroom-based assessments and progress monitoring and our own mid-year and, and uh, spring review. We've been actually pleasantly surprised by uh, the degree to which many students have been able to stay with us. Um, so that's one learning, that illusion of independence, the yeah. need for deeper collaboration. That's a big learning that we'll take uh, forward. And I think an enhanced respect for 
learning outside the classroom and school setting that happens sort of organically without our involvement. Um, I, I think that's been an opportunity for some learned humility, but also some learned reflection on where are those other uh, learning experiences happening? What's the classroom in the community? Yep. Where is it and what does it look like? And that, I love that uh, math, uh, unmasking the illusion of independence. And it does make me think, Amanda, of the work that you've been doing with the Community Learning Collaborative here in Boston. So would love to draw you in and hear what have been your top lessons about family and student outreach through this new multi-organizational effort. Yes, thank you so much uh, for having me today uh, to the Bellwether folks for hosting this event. Uh, really uh, wanted to start with just a, a couple of comments. Um, one is we launched the Learning Pods as, as a means to provide an equitable opportunity for students to receive uh, academic support, social emotional supports, enrichment opportunities. As, as we started to hear about learning pods at the onset of the pandemic, it seemed like the learning pods were really only for uh, families who had access to creating them and bringing them together, having pods in their homes and the like. What we found uh, was that uh, we had very, a large number of families who uh, had to go to work. And what would they do with their students? They could not leave their students to be independent learning, in, independently learning in their homes. And so uh, four leaders came together, two African-American leaders, two Latino leaders. Uh, our organizations came together to say, what kind of opportunity can we offer? What kind of collaborative should we create to make sure that the students who are connected to our organizations and their families who are connected to our organizations have the high quality supports that they need during this especially challenging time. So what we've learned um, it, and what we've learned is sort of what we put into it. The thinking that we put into the creation of the pods is bearing out to be uh, positive outcomes and I think learning that will long-term um, be something we'd like to see integrated into uh, the school environment. So, so uh, you'll hear similar words that Michael um, mentioned. Uh, first was is the foundation of trust. Uh, the community-based organizations involved um, already had pre-existing relationships with the families. They were connected to the why to the base, which is a sports organization. Uh, and so we were able to draw in those families. They already knew the organizations and had built this foundation of trust. So that was first and foremost, uh, the key to attracting families to feel safe to join the pods. And then I think the collaboration part, again, another word we've been hearing already quite a bit, collaboration being key in that uh, we wanted to provide a consistent experience so that we could draw on learnings from it, um, from this experience of supporting the pods and leading the pods. Uh, we have found uh, a great deal of learning and success by having an intentional focus on having Latino and African-American educators, uh, site-based staff that are working with the students and that also engenders the kind of trust that we've been looking for um, and wanting to create and facilitate. So those would be a few things, trust, collaboration, the centering of students and families and through the collaboration, the consistency in approach that we're taking. That's great. And I'm hearing a lot of consistency already in the themes that you are all lifting up this sort of dense web of communication that Peter hit upon, the trust and accessing assets that are already in your community and making sure that you are um, reaching out and, and you know building upon those relationships. Um, are there other new ways that you've connected or communicated with families that you would lift up specifically as 
tools you've relied on to either get family input or to um, connect with students and bring them in that you think others uh, should know about and, and maybe try out in their own context? Well, I, I think it's very important that um, our listeners are really attuned to the diversity out there in terms of language and culture. And I think it's really important to, for educational leaders to meet our community where they're at, rather than expect them to come to our schoolhouse doors, right? Especially now. So that means language. I meet with uh, our parents in uh, like the uh, Korean parents, Vietnamese parents, they're all separately, South Asians, African-Americans, and of course, Latinos, right? We have 40, I'm sure I speak with, for many of us, there are just over 40 languages spoken in our in our district. So I think that's really important to continue to build the communication and ensuring that it's two-way communication. There's a lot that they have to say. I think that um, the parents, obviously, I think this is gonna be across the spectrum, concerned about the social, emotional, and mental health and assurance that you have uh, culturally responsive mental health professionals, social workers, psychologists, the teams that are very uh, sensitive and aware of that. This whole concept of prima thoras too, that, you know, that came out of uh, the, the, the healthcare um, in, you know, agencies, the prima thoras about uh, promotoras, I, I'm not pronouncing it right, but you know, to have these uh, uh, sort of lay people who are trained in certain areas who have high levels of trust, right? Like in the Latino community, have those, they call them the comadres, right? That are out there and uh, helping to represent and communicate, uh, especially as we transition into uh, vaccinations and, and fully reopening and re-engaging. And I think finally, to define what we mean by learning loss, because I think the parents are more concerned about that social emotional. And it's important that our own stakeholders understand that it's not, yes, there are gonna be, there's gonna be huge gaps out there, but it's not that the kids turned off their brains, right? So we need to uh, approach it more holistically and more asset-based. So, you know, I'll just, uh, so there's just a lot to, uh, I think, in terms of add to this conversation. Curious uh, for other, like, to hear how your relationships with community groups, higher education partners, career uh, partners have evolved this year. And whether you envision these um, evolutions in the way you're interacting with other partners um, sticking over the next year, being different going forward than they have been in the past. Peter, you do know, you wanna dive into that one? Sure, I, we, we absolutely anticipate that, that we've changed some things. There, this has been an inflection point and in, in some ways those inflections are permanent. Um, for example, if we try to bring uh, 25 superintendents and you know, we're about an hour, hour and a half south of Denver, um, if we try to bring statewide leaders down from Denver to a superintendent's meeting, that, that has been challenging in the past. This year with using remote meetings, um, we found that it's actually more efficient. Um, we're more able to access and, and connect with um, not just our state agency leaders, but we've met with representatives from our governor's office or our state board of education. And that's not something that, that we're willing to lay down. Um, we, we simply didn't have that technical expertise a year and a half ago. We have it now. It's a tool and, and we've added it to our, to our toolbox going forward. Um, one, of the, one of the really specific things that, that we've identified is that we spend a lot of time on the road getting together, getting to each other. Yep. And that it's still in, intensely valuable to be in the same room, to see each other eye to eye and read body language and, and facial expression. And so we haven't lost that humanity, but what we've realized is maybe that doesn't need to be the mode for every meeting. Uh, yep. Even in my own, my own role where I uh, typically would be meeting with with principals and, and with other district leaders on a, on a weekly or every other weekly basis, we don't have to make every one of those meetings in person. And so if I can stack up six or seven meetings by using technology and eliminating travel time, yeah. there's, that's a win. That's, that's a gain of time back 
for the human interaction. So that's one, uh, another lesson learned for us. Uh, we also really, really drove in on uh, devices for students. We are not a one-to-one -one district, but we have pockets of one-to-one -one and, and one-to-two. So we distributed about 90% of our student devices, we distributed them into the community. We had a whole, uh, we had to stand up a whole process and system. We had to disassemble Chromebook carts and iPad carts and, and, and MacBook carts. We had to disassemble all of those, get them out into families, track them, upgrade them. Then we had to bring them back into the district, reassemble all of those classroom carts. Uh, and so we had to develop protocols and systems for distribution that were not only medically sound and you know zero contact distribution was a priority but they also had to be educationally sound and even just um lo logistically sound we had to know where those devices went who had them and where they were coming back so we developed a lot of these systems because we had to but now that we have them we know that we could distribute Chromebooks over a, a winter break if we wanted to, or a summer break if we wanted to address regression or provide a resource into the community. So we want to take advantage of what we were forced to learn and develop and use that for the, the optimal reasons going, going forward. Yeah, that's great. And Michael, you have a lot of partnerships, I imagine, given your work around career pathways. Can you talk a little bit about how this past year um, impacted those partnerships and whether there were evolutions in your partnerships that you think um, you might want to hold on to moving forward as well. Yeah, I think this is a time almost like our, you know, na massive Hurricane Katrina, right? So we need to, it's an opportunity to reflect on what education is all about, right? K-12, K-16. And I know our higher ed partners are also concerned about what this all means going forward. There could be uh, prior to the pandemic, we know that young people were getting stuck in gig jobs, right? Uh, expensive uh, cost of going to the university. And I think that it gave us an opportunity to really reflect on the differences between college readiness and career readiness, right? They're not mutually exclusive, but they are different. And the focus on career readiness means that what are you doing to develop this thing called emotional intelligence, you know, the grit uh, and the, we call it the five C's and, you know, it's the soft skills. Career readiness also forces systems to look at the, the, the technical skills, the hard skills, right? The dual credit and how important the relationships with community colleges and businesses mean in terms of what are you trying to do in terms of, right? Building these type of pathways that are not just college, but college and or career readiness and life readiness, right? So those questions I think are gonna be more important than ever post pandemic because our, um, challenge to, to us um, regionally is about, you know, because there's a lot of emphasis on equity, and of course, this is what Bellwether is all about, but an access. So uh, social justice is really going to be about access to meaningful jobs. At the end of the day, it's about jobs. And we know that the Biden administration is going to be pushing out a big jobs bill. And I think it's really important that our educational voices are part of that. And what can we do to reinvent ourselves? We have over 80 corporate and nonprofit partners. We have a huge, robust uh, opportunities for internships and mentoring um, and huge partnerships with community colleges. Because if you think, Mary, about the traditional college readiness, community colleges were left out of that. Right. And this is a huge opportunity to reconnect with them. They're very nimble. They can create pathways aligned to cutting edge areas, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, biotechnology. We need to take full advantage of that intellectual capital um, as we go forward. Yep. Now, Amanda, you and your uh, nonprofit partners in Boston have been, you know, in some ways on the other side of this relationship um, that Peter and Michael have just been talking about. So I would love to hear you talk about, you know, how have you, how well have you been able to establish two-way communication with the districts um, that you're working with? And, uh, um, 
are there are there elements of what you have been doing together with your partners and the districts that you are excited to see carry forward into the next year? So I would say the relationship with the district has been uh, more at the school level and more individual per student. So the relationship has been forged most closely between the student, the family, and the actual educator that that student is working directly with within the district. So it's been actually, um, it, it's been very positive because what the student has then is the support on site from the educators that we've hired as part of the pods who can work directly with the teacher who is responsible within the district, obviously, of educating the child. And so the child is getting reinforcement and reinforced supports uh, to follow through on their academics. And what we've heard anecdotally, because we're in the process of doing um, evaluation of the pods over the last several months, but anecdotally at this point, we've, we've heard from the teachers that their students who are involved in the pods are having better outcomes, are experiencing their education in a more positive way and are performing academically better. And so that is a, a very encouraging sign. We're also hearing it from the parents and the families to say, my child is happy. My child is uh, thriving in this environment because they get the kind of support that they really need, not only the academic support, but the social emotional support. They get to engage in enrichment. So they, we, we, we get the uh, ability to support the whole child. And that was part of our um, aim in terms of putting the pods together. And I think that is um, the learning that we're going to see coming out of this that we'd like to see continue in terms of um, down to the classroom relationship between the educator, the nonprofit organizations that know the, child, the children really well and the families. So it's, it's a different way of looking at what the partnership looks like. And I think what the pandemic has um, also surfaced is this need to have equal partnership at the table between families, between community-based organizations, between the schools um, that will contribute to the better outcomes for students. And that's what I would love to see carried forward as we think about um, how education can change. And again, it goes back to collaboration um, and, and more of an equitable um, sort of uh, equitable perspectives and the, the, the equity around whose voice gets to inform what happens next with the student. Michael, it looks like you have your hand raised. Did you wanna jump in here? Yeah, I, we love the idea of the learning pause and we're, we're approaching it as sort of a uh, kind of a incubator of teacher ideas. I mean, based on what Amanda's saying too, you know, to create and innovate new learning experiences. Because we talked earlier about making education sticky, right, in terms of our approach to learning loss. And I think that we need to unleash the creative abilities of teachers to uh, apply more project-based learning, things that, that are going to really help kids uh, problem solve. So we have uh, launched learning uh, pods across our district. At high schools, they're, they're capped at 350 students. At the junior highs, at 250 students. So um, large uh, numbers of uh, pods that can morph, hopefully, into units that can be used for credit recovery, right? Because everybody's going to be dealing with credit recovery. And we're trying to, we're probably using traditional, but we're also using these innovative ways that are sticky with kids that are still, there's a lot of embedded writing and reflection and problem solving embedded in there. So um, I think out of this, you're gonna see a lot of innovation, these types of innovations. And we wanna um, 
you know, um, make them open source. Because I think you're going to have teachers that want to sort of share with other teachers what's working, district sharing with each other. I think this is an opportunity to truly innovate and, and uh, make education uh, more in, into morphing more into um, applied problem solving, because there's no question that this young generation have everywhere they look, there's going to be problems and they can't see that as a negative. They have to see that as opportunities that they can help solve. And through those opportunities, there's going to be whole new fields of careers and jobs created. And I think it's going to come from the, our own kids. Yeah, Mary, let, let me um, chime in a little bit on that, on that concept, particularly uh, that we have we have created some learning during this pandemic that we didn't know we needed to provide, and so although there there certainly has, have been some um, some disruptions to conventional academic experiences, there have also been some real gains in terms of students being assertive, students being independent and flexible in and some of the life characteristics, life ready success skills that we need to inculcate in our students, those happened during this and are still happening during this pandemic yeah. in ways that we aspired to, but we weren't quite sure how to deliver. And so uh, as, as one quick example, in Colorado Springs, we have three major universities. We have the Air Force Academy, uh, we have the University of Colorado, and we have Colorado College. Three very different institutions, very important and, and leading institutions in higher ed. But our community college, which is Pikes Peak Community College, serves more students than those three institutions put together. So if we're not connecting, and, and we're doing a lot of work with concurrent enrollment, uh, with our uh, career preparation and our college preparation, we're really looking at, in, at fusing those two. So for example, if I can place a student into a workplace setting as an intern for a job shadow, that's a great experience. And who really needs that experience is not necessarily career path students. It's students that have been in academic settings for 12 years. They're gonna spend four, five, six, or seven more years. We desperately need to get them into an applied setting now so that the academic work that they're, they're gonna continue has a, has a foundation. We talk about grounding it in the field, right? And so, we are seeing students uh, step up with non-academic learning that is life critical. I just had a, a couple of students in one of our, our middle schools, eighth grade students contact me. I'm the senior educator in our district. I love that these eighth grade students felt empowered and, and that they had a right and a responsibility to contact me and say, we think we need a different model on Fridays. We need flexible Fridays so we can talk to our students and catch up on our work. I love that. We didn't have a system or a program to teach that, and yet they learned it. And so I think we, we need to show some humility and resourcefulness and self-awareness to figure out what were some, some advances to this industry, to education that were forced upon us that we should grab onto and, and hold on and refine into the future. Um, yeah. Just one example, but the idea that, that I've got middle school students that are sending me appropriate professional communications, advocating for something that they know they need, I, I think that is a tremendous development and we ought not lose it. Yeah, that's terrific. And sort of on the theme of, you know, making a little bit of lemonade out of the lemons from the past year, I have one last question and then would love to turn it over to questions from our attendees. But assuming that schools in your communities are able to be in person next year with a relatively normal operations, you know, what from your family and community outreach strategies over this past year would you like to see continue into the future? And Amanda, when you respond, would love to have you maybe give some advice to your district colleagues around how you would like to see districts um, bring in community organizations and, and families. So uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll point to you to go first, Amanda, since I specified that sub question for you. Sure. So the, what we have learned and what we think the students and families want that should be carried forward is uh, 
success in focusing on the student, their identity, affirming who they are and the assets that they bring. That's one thing. Um, the second is a focus on mental health supports because we are hearing from families, Latino families, that um, that is of top concern for them. And I think we've all heard it and experienced it. So let's continue with that type of support and balance that support with the academic supports that might be needed. And then um, third, I would say is let's make sure that we consider community-based partners who really know the families and students well, let's keep them at the table. Let's make sure that they are at the table um, also in devising and thinking about the approaches for when school resumes in the fall and see community-based partners as true partners um, along with families and students. I think, Peter, you gave a great example of the students who had agency to reach out to you. We wanna foster more of that. We want our students to feel like they have that kind of agency around what kind of learning they receive. Um, so those would be the three things that I would say would look um, to me. And I think as a result of what we've learned from the pod, something we'd like to see carried forward into the new year, new school year. Michael, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I, th I think that um, going forward, the concept of community schools, right? I think many of us are familiar with that, but it's it's really sort of uh, the pandemic has, has forced us in a good way to really build out community schools, the partnerships with the nonprofits, uh, the partnerships with higher ed, being able to deliver the food banks and the uh, mental and physical health uh, services. These are gonna be vital pieces, you know, where schools are positions as hub of neighborhoods and communities. And I think that that's going to be important, an important sustainable uh, infrastructure that hopefully we can maintain uh, beyond the pandemic. Peter, what would you add? You know, I don't, I don't know that I can improve those two answers. Um, I, I can elaborate. Uh, that's, that's sort of our profession. But um, <laughs> I might suggest you uh, you sick me on the online learning question that's in the chat box. Uh, that's instead. great. That's great. I was I was going to uh, lift that up. Um, so just to, so everyone knows what Peter is referencing, there's a question that's that a great question. What have you observed about the persistence of online learning? So once schools reopen for in person learning, how have you thought about investment in online versus traditional learning? So Mary, I, I think at Bellwether, you all would wanna would wanna hear this little little piece of insight. Policy really matters, and the policy ecosystem um, matters a great deal. I'm I'm grateful to operate in a in a state that has a long-standing commitment to educational innovation and choice. We have an Innovation Schools Act. We've had a, a Charter School Act since the mid '90s. We have an Online Schools Act uh, since the mid aughts. And in, in the district where, where I lead, we have tried to take advantage of all of those. So we authorize a charter school that is also a statewide online school uh, that serves over 5,000 students around Colorado. And that school saw a surge of enrollment. Um, that school, which is uh, Goal High School, happens to be one of my favorite graduations because the way that school would works they serve students who have not either been successful or had access to a great conventional education so when they do graduation sometimes that that diploma earner walking across the stage is holding hands with a child and sometimes they're also holding hands with a parent because goal high school has a policy where if a student is enrolled and they have a, a parent who also needs high school credentials they serve them as well and they support parents, they support students that are coming out of life challenges back into an educational stream. And so we already had a foundation of serving using online education. We also host a district operated online school that serves K-12 students statewide. And so I think the, the lesson of the pandemic is that having more options creates more access. That's true for culturally sensitive and responsive education. That's true for 
technically responsive education. For a lot of reasons, we have discovered that some of our students have thrived in a more flexible schedule and with more, um, more combinations. I, I don't know that we're going to see a, a massive move to complete online or pure online, uh, but I think we're going to see more and more schools mix in online and flexible schedule options because it serves our students. It serves the life circumstance they're in, but it also serves the learning and personal style that they prefer. And the districts that maintain a monolithic approach are going to lose students to options. Because even if you don't have a geographic competitor, you're going to have a private school competitor. You're going to have an online option, charter option, magnet school option, contract school option. And those students will find the, the, the way that works for them. And I think families have gotten more assertive and more informed about the options that are out there. So we better be providing culturally and technically responsive options that provide access to more students. So I think online will persist and will uh, refine as one of the elements of a great comprehensive public education system. I, I couldn't agree more I, num with number one, the policy obstacles that do stand in the way for a lot of, uh, a lot of districts in a lot of states. Um, it's not going to be as easy to innovate around this, but the comfort level among families and students, particularly at the high school level, around being able to engage online in a way that's satisfying and that, um, to one of your earlier points, uh, like enables some of these life skills and a little bit more self-directed learning than we um, typically see in an all in-person environment. So I think that is one of the uh, one of the most exciting potential areas for innovation coming out of this. Um, Amanda, a question for you uh, uh, from the chat. Will the pods or some variation on the partnership continue once schools are fully reopened in Boston? Thanks for the question. So right now we're planning for summer support. So all of the organizations involved in the collaboration offer summer programming, but they had varying levels of academic supports. And so what we're working on right now is a more consistent approach to providing academic supports within the context of a summer camp setting that most of these organizations offer. So that is sort of step one for us in terms of continuing the pods, but in a, in a bit of a different way. I would say that uh, longer term, we're, we're still not 100% sure of how the pods might continue, but I think there is a reality um, and I think Peter hit on it, which was families want um, different options. And we have had several families who have stayed within the pods because they are much more comfortable with their children being there and in that type of setting. I, I think that uh, we still have large percentages of African-American and Latino families who have some reluctance to be an in-person learning that may continue into the fall with children maybe not yet having uh, access to vaccines. So I think there's a world where the pods continue and support uh, a certain percentage of students who have thrived within the pod structure and also provides continued opportunity for the community to come together to support the children and families in that way, in the pod structure. Well, it is, we're at time and I did wanna take a moment to thank you all for taking time out of your day today to share what you're working on, share what you're learning and uh, hopefully learn a little bit from one another. So Peter, Amanda, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. And with that, we will sign off. Take care everyone.